Have you ever stopped to think about what lies behind the most widespread light weapon in history? Every year, more than 1 million rifles derived from the AK-47 design are assembled, an obligatory presence in movies, video games, and war documentaries. Yet few know the industrial journey that transforms glowing steel and laminated wood into a rifle renowned for its almost legendary reliability. In 1947, then-Sergeant Mikhail Kalashnikov set out to create an automatic weapon so simple and robust that it could fire reliably from polar blizzards to dusty deserts. From that ambition was born the Avtomat Kalashnikova model 1947, the famous AK-47. And to honor his philosophy, modern production still revolves around two pillars. High toughness carbon steel, which arrives in ingots or thick sheets unloaded by overhead cranes and traced by batch and composition and laminated birch or beech wood, cut into boards that pass through drying ovens to remove moisture before any cutting. While the metal moves on to furnaces exceeding 1050 degrees Celsius to acquire the necessary hardness, the wood enters hydraulic presses that compact its fibers with thermosetting resins, creating a laminate capable of resisting impact and preventing cracks due to humidity changes, the exact combination that enables a reliable rifle in the harshest environments. With the steel glowing from heat, it is poured into casting molds that reproduce the basic silhouettes of the receiver, bolt carrier, and barrel. Once solidified, each block goes through stamping presses capable of applying up to 1,000 tons of pressure. This results in uniform outer walls and internal ribs that will withstand detonation. Next, CNC lathes drill the barrel's bore with tolerances measured in hundredths of a millimeter. A rifled reamer, continuously lubricated, creates the helical grooves that stabilize the bullet in flight. Other machining centers cut slots for the safety, pinholes, and threads that will later receive assembly screws. Smaller parts, trigger, hammer, magazine catch, are stamped on smaller presses and then subjected to thermal treatments, annealing to relieve stress, quenching to harden critical surfaces, and tempering to prevent brittleness. Inspection is done piece by piece. Calibrated templates and laser lights reveal any deviation. A defective component is separated without hesitation. The AK's reputation for reliability allows no compromise. With every metal component verified to the micrometer, fine assembly begins. The mobile bolt carrier slides into the receiver along with the recoil spring, a piece that absorbs the energy of the recoil and returns the bolt to its previous position after each shot. Next, the hammer, firing pin, and trigger assembly are installed with their springs, preloaded and heat-treated, tested to endure more than 100,000 cycles without losing tension. Specialized technicians ensure contact surfaces are polished and aligned, apply a film of anti-corrosion lubricant, and check that there are no burrs that could impede movement. Each rifle then performs a manual dry cycle. The charging handle is pulled, released, the trigger pressed, and the full sequence of moving parts is observed. Any unusual resistance, metallic noise, or asymmetry immediately sends the weapon back to the adjustment table where the problem surface is rectified or the part replaced before repeating the test, thus ensuring a smooth, reliable, and safe firing system. With the mechanical heart now ready, external transformation begins. The stamp top cover lowers onto the receiver and is secured with an elastic pin that allows full disassembly in seconds. The stock, handguard, and grip are added. Traditionally varnished laminated wood, though modern versions favor reinforced polymers to reduce weight. The rifled barrel is screwed or riveted with micrometric precision to the chamber to ensure perfect gas sealing. Then, the gas tube piston assembly is coupled to convert firing pressure into controlled recoil that reloads the weapon. Rear and front sights are adjusted for windage and elevation to ensure accurate hits beyond 300 meters. Finally, the iconic 30-round curved magazine with its banana shape feeds ammunition without jams, even when covered in sand or mud. Each piece fits within minimal tolerances. A millimeter out of place would be enough to ruin shell ejection and disable the rifle. Once assembly is complete, each rifle proceeds non-stop to the internal shooting range, a ballistic tunnel lined with steel and sensors where the first burst is fired using standard ammunition. High-speed cameras and Doppler radars capture the firing cycle frame by frame to confirm a firing rate close to 600 rounds per minute, detect any jamming, and record the trajectory of the ejected casings. After passing this functional test, the platform is anchored to a precision bench aimed at electronic targets at 100 and 300 meters. The software measures grouping and requires all impacts to fall within the nominal circle. If even one falls outside, 
The weapon goes to inspection. The next challenge is thermal resistance. Several 30-round loads are fired until the outer barrel wall nears 350 degrees Celsius. An infrared thermal viewer monitors the temperature and, once the threshold is reached, technicians extract the barrel and apply internal gauges to verify the rifling hasn't deformed. Then, the safety is activated in automatic mode, and the weapon is struck against a rubber anvil to rule out accidental discharges or the dreaded double trigger pull. A drop test from 1.5 meters onto a steel plate is also performed along with immersion in a dust chamber and a salt spray chamber to ensure that neither fine sand nor moisture interrupts the reloading cycle. Reports are generated at each stage and uploaded to the MES linked to the serial number engraved beforehand. If the software detects any value out of tolerance, the unit is diverted to the diagnostic cell, where a 3D scanner compares the suspicious part with the master CAD model. If the deviation can be corrected, it is polished or replaced and the rifle returns to the start of the test sequence. If not, it is completely disassembled and its metal redirected to the foundry to close the recycling loop. Once the weapon passes all ballistic and dimensional tests without failure, a high-precision fiber laser engraves the receiver with the serial number, year of manufacture, and country of origin, but also a micro QR code linking to an immutable digital record, so any inspection, whether at customs, arsenals, or training fields, can scan and trace the rifle's complete history. The weapon then enters a degreasing tunnel where nozzles spray neutral solvents that remove oil residue and metal particles. A compressed air jet at 60 degrees Celsius dries it in under three minutes, and to prevent corrosion, a fine mist of inhibitor oil is applied, penetrating pins and threads. Once treated, operators wearing anti-static gloves disassemble the magazine, top cover, and other movable subassemblies placing each piece in foam die-cut compartments inside an individual box. That box includes a user manual in multiple languages with maintenance diagrams, a basic toolkit, screwdrivers, spare pins, gas key, a microfiber cloth, a cleaning brush, and, depending on the contract, optional accessories like a tactical sling, bayonet, or critical parts kit. Once sealed, the boxes travel via conveyor to the automatic palletizing station, where robotic arms arrange them into airtight containers certified to MIL-STD-81H. These chests withstand salt spray, 15G vibrations, and temperature fluctuations from minus 40 to plus 70 degrees Celsius, and they include electronic loggers that monitor shocks, humidity, and pressure during transport, creating a record that accompanies the rifle to its final destination. With more than 100 million units produced, a figure encompassing original AK-47s and their countless variants and copies, this rifle represents, according to various sources, around 20% of all firearms in circulation. After its official adoption by the USSR in the late 1940s, Moscow granted manufacturing licenses to allied countries to strengthen its geopolitical influence. Thus, production lines emerged in Bulgaria, Poland, East Germany, China, North Korea, Egypt, and Cuba. With the Soviet collapse and archive openings, the technology spread even further. Today, at least 30 nations hold assembly permits, while unauthorized workshops in conflict zones craft homemade variants using rudimentary tools, often recycling scrap metal. In black markets of unstable regions, an AK can cost less than a hot meal, making it the preferred choice of guerrillas, insurgent groups, and organized crime. This omnipresence also holds symbolic weight. It appears on flags, Mozambique, for example, military emblems, and even cultural magazine covers. At the same time, it remains a standard-issue weapon in dozens of armies and police forces in low- and middle-income countries due to its simple maintenance and the massive availability of spare parts. Paradoxically, its creator, Mikhail Kalashnikov, never received royalties. As a Soviet state engineer, he ceded rights to the government and died in 2013, reiterating that he had designed the tool to defend the homeland. Though he acknowledged his sorrow over the indiscriminate use that various actors had made of the design. Seven decades of service with minimal modifications, new polymers, optics rails, grenade launcher compatibility, confirmed the robustness of the original platform. Thus, the AK-47 has become a dual icon, a symbol of popular resistance in some contexts and of widespread violence in others an eternal reminder of how engineering can transcend its initial purpose and shape world history in ways as complex as they are contradictory. Beyond production figures and the awe inspired by watching an assembly line operate like clockwork, there lies a human dilemma that cannot be overlooked. Each unit manufactured is simultaneously a technical marvel and a latent threat. Electric arc furnaces that turn ingots into glowing metal, 
hydraulic presses that stretch and shape pieces with hundreds of tons of force, six-axis robots that assemble mechanisms with sub-millimeter precision, and laser inspections that measure tolerances invisible to the human eye, all celebrate the extraordinary capacity to transform raw material into complex objects. Yet this same technological display reveals an ethical responsibility that cannot be delegated or postponed. The quality protocol includes software-guided dimensional controls, metallographic analysis for microcracks, and test shots that subject each weapon to overpressure beyond operational levels, all to ensure that the product works flawlessly. But when the immaculate packaging, individual boxes with multilingual manuals, maintenance kits, and impact sensors, is sealed and stacked in airtight containers ready for transport, a different chapter begins. The real-life journey of the device in the hands of people, organizations, or governments whose motivations and circumstances can vary radically. Knowing this entire path, from the roar of the furnaces melting steel to the logistical silence of sealed pallets, invites us to ask at what point admiration for efficiency, profitability, and engineering skill must give way to a broader reflection on the social and human consequences of production. Fascination with precision mechanics is legitimate, but it only makes full sense when we acknowledge that every product, no matter how reliable or sophisticated, is embedded in a web of decisions that affect lives, communities, and ultimately, the way we conceive the collective responsibility that accompanies every technological advance. Each batch that leaves the assembly line reflects two realities, that of the technical process that created it and that of the different uses it may be given. Inside the plant, thermographs and gauges verify tolerances, algorithms confirm firing cadence, and security seals ensure proper packaging. Outside, the rifle ceases to be an object under industrial control and becomes part of diverse political, economic, or security scenarios. This contrast between the regularity of the manufacturing process and the uncertainty of its final use invites us to consider not just how the weapon is produced, but also its purpose, who will use it, and to what effect.